We, um, in our family, we have um, six kids, but really there's, there's more than just our, the kids that are part of our family. We've got a um, dog, cat, uh, there's even a bird that shows up every once in a while. But we have more than, more than the animals, too. We also have, uh, well, one in particular, I didn't bring her, Carson, I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, but I asked Carson this morning if I could introduce you uh, to another member of our family. Some of you didn't know, we moved with her. Um, her name is Yellow Baby. Uh, Yellow Baby is, became a member of our family one, was it Christmas? Is it Christmas? One Christmas when Carson received her as a gift. Now it is a yellow cloth baby, right? Uh, and Carson named this baby Yellow Baby. Yellow Baby, uh, you may ask, what does she do? She does a lot with the family. Um, she sleeps with the family. Uh, she used to eat with the family. She used to take baths. Uh, with the family. She's losing some of the yellow. Uh, she plays uh, with the family. She even travels with the family. Now this is where the story, this is where you're going to have uh, memories of things that someone in your family has been attached to. There was one, it was probably a Christmas trip. Uh, we'd gone to visit family. It was time to load up. Everyone heard the call to the fifth call or 14th call to load up except Yellow Baby. Thank you. And so an hour into the trip, it becomes aware that she's absent in the vehicle. Now I tried as best I could to explain that perhaps Yellow baby's on vacation. Can we just say that she's visiting an extended amount of time with, with family? But guess what? Yellow baby's part of the family. And we left part of our family. So an hour into our trip, we turn around and we go back. Yes, to get yellow baby. Uh, Carson still. Uh, has yellow baby this day. Uh, you would have been introduced to her, but I didn't bring her. I'm sorry. Uh, she likes to stay at home. Uh, for obvious reasons, she's afraid we're going to leave her somewhere. So, <clears throat> but anyway, she's at home where she stays most of the time now. Now, the point is, have you ever had something you've been so attached to that it's just sort of part of the family, part of who you are? Or have you or someone in your family ever had something that they were so attached to that they just couldn't leave home without it? Most of us have. Somewhere in our story, in our journey, you have that thing that you just had to have. It's part of the family. And you're not going to leave home and you're hopefully not going to leave it uh, anywhere else. Well, in a, in a lot of ways, the theme this morning is about family. Being a part of the family. And God feels this way about every Christian. Everyone who's received Jesus Christ, who's been born of, the, of water and the Spirit, is a part of uh, what the Bible says is we're a, a child of God, part of a heavenly family. And it is wonderful to belong, uh, to, to have a place to call home. Uh, to be connected with family that love you, with friends that you can just share anything with. Um, belonging and being a part of something like that is wonderful. Well, we're, we're at that part in the series, uh, this Lenten sermon series. We're at that part of the Apostles' Creed that goes over belonging. Belonging to the church. During Lent, we have been methodically going through the Apostles' Creed, which is one of the oldest uh, statements of faith that the Christian church has. Um, it's, it is at least the foundation of the Christian message. It's a, it's a creed that we speak, uh, at least here, just about every Sunday. 
Um, a lot of churches have a version of the Apostles' Creed where we're at the point this morning. Um, I believe, last Sunday was I believe in the Holy Spirit. This morning we're at this phrase. And the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. The Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Now folks will occasionally ask me, I thought we were Methodist. Uh, what's the thing with the Catholic Church? And I remind them that this is not Catholic in the sense of the Roman Catholic denomination. It's Catholic in the sense of universal. Catholic means uh, universal. So when, when we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, what we're saying is I believe that we are not the only Christians meeting. Um, we are not the only body that exists. That we have brothers and sisters in Christ uh, within the county, within the state, within the nation, within the hemisphere, and indeed around the world. We, we believe in the holy, catholic, universal church. And the communion of saints. So this morning we're going to explore that, um, especially through this, this text this morning uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, because the last bit of that chapter give us several important things to be reminded of as to why the church is important in our lives. And um, we're going to look at at least three of those this morning. Now, being a part of the Christian church first means that we are connected with God's people. Being part of the Christian church means that you are connected with God's people past, present, and future. There's no other way to be connected with God's people other than through God's family. Verse 19, Paul says, You are no longer strangers, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now this morning before uh, worship, we were uh, talking about family reunions. And uh, mo I would imagine most of you, the majority of you, have memories, a memory, or several memories, of family reunions. And not, not sort of what they've become today, but what they used to be, the big ones. Most of you probably have a memory of the big family reunions. Mine are all in Alabama, on my dad's mother's side, and she was a god one. So the Godwin family reunions every year was a big ordeal. It, it, I felt like everyone in the county was related and they would all gather on this one farm every year and bring in food. Oh my goodness at the food. Casserole after casserole, corn and green beans. And this is not store-bought stuff, right? This is homegrown, yes. Yes, this is good stuff. And conversations and fellowship. I mean, there, most of the conversations I had were sort of awkward. I mean, you know, every, every year it seemed like you get the same, I would get the same question from the same fella. Judy, I don't believe he's grown a bit since last year we've seen him. Are you feeding him? I was doing the best I could to be as tall as the other hillbillies, but I could only get so far with what mom and dad were feeding me. But there I was, doing the best I could with family, listening to the... And then you get the occasional... This, this was mainly from the women. He looks like so-and-so. Aunt Mabel, doesn't he look like so-and-so? And I'd say, Mom, who is that? You don't, you don't know who it is. Well, why not? They've been dead for 50 years. Well, why do I look like them? Because you're a part of the family. You just, you're just a part of the family. But the part I couldn't wait for, after the food, after the awkward conversations, after a little bit of front yard playtime, you'd hear the tractor start up. 
And that's when everybody would run towards the field. And as many of you as could would get on the trailer, on the back of the tractor, which would take you, and the rest of us would have to run behind it, take you down to the river where there was a big rope attached to a tree, and you could swing out into the water. So it was a lot of fun. One big family. You know, in a lot of ways, church family is a little bit like that. I mean, we have our times of fellowship, a lot of food, a lot of casseroles, a lot of good food. We have our conversations, sometimes the awkward conversations, but everybody's got those in a family, and the church family has those too. But you also have your, your fun times. You have your, your good times. You have those moments where you celebrate. Or you're happy. You know, this year, part of what we're doing is celebrating an anniversary. Uh, we turned 50 inside this building, but 125 in the community. It's a big year. It's uh, something to be thankful for as a church family. And being a part of that connects us with um, God's people. In particular, God's people here. Uh, many of you were a part of the move from sort of downtown to, to here into this facility. And you have memories of the buildings before that. So being a part of this church family connects you to the past. But not only that, those who have gone on before. I mean, there are many of my family members earthly family members that are also a part of my heavenly family, all my grandparents have gone, my dad passed away, that one day I will be reunited with through faith. So my connection with God's people is not just the earthly connection, but it's also a heavenly co connection. The communion of the saints. We're a part of that connection here and a part of that connection there. We continue a, a legacy and a, a rich heritage that those before us have passed on and we continue that heritage and legacy today. We've been blessed as a church family and it's worth celebrating. So this year we hope to have sort of a family reunion, you know, a, a church homecoming and celebrate who we are in the community. Being a part of the Christian church allows us to connect with God's people. There's no other way to do that except being a part of the family. Second, it also um, allows us to share in God's mission. To be a part of uh, the mission that God has for the church. Now you can't get that if you're not connected with the church. Verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What has been passed down to us has been God's mission through the prophets, through the apostles, and the key piece of that message, of their teaching, prophets and apostles, is Jesus Christ. Well, that's the church's mission. That's what we're here for, is to bring... Jesus to the next generation, to introduce the next group to their Savior. Um, there was a, a symbol, actually we know this symbol, uh, but you may not know the history behind this Christian symbol. Probably the oldest Christian symbol that we've found in caves and that have been found in homes and on rocks um, was a secret symbol. And here's how it worked. Uh, let's say you and your family were traveling and you saw another group. Uh, you were about to meet another group. Now this was back when it was not um, the mission. God's mission for the church was done a little more covertly because to be an outspoken Christian meant uh, persecution, maybe even death. So they had a secret sign or a secret image. It was actually a drawing. So what you would do is stop your family and you would draw, if you had a stick, if you didn't have a stick, you'd use your finger 
an arch right there in the sand and you just sort of back away. And the other family or group coming would look at that and if they could finish that drawing, you knew they were brothers and sisters in Christ. But if they saw it, looked at you, maybe did some sort of greeting and kept going, you knew just keep your head down and let's just keep going. They're not a part of our heavenly family. Now what they would finish is another arch, but theirs would be upside down. So you got one arch going this way, one arch going this way. It almost looks like a football, but it doesn't connect on this end. Instead, the ends miss each other and they form what looks like a tail. So imagine a football with a tail. You've got the Christian fish. That's the first secret sign of the Christian church. And if somebody could connect that other arch, you knew they were part of the family. Now why a fish? Because we're fishers of men. We're fishers of people. This was the calling. As the first disciples, you are called to be fishers of people. It's, it's part of our mission to bring Jesus to the next town, to the next community, to the next group of folks. So they used that very simple image to identify themselves with each other and to be reminded that they're in mission together. Can't do that on your own. Got to be a part of the church to do that. And the last thing that we get from at least this text on why it's important to be a part of the church is that it allows you to develop your spiritual gifts or your spiritual muscle. Now that's at the very end. Uh, verse 22. In whom you also are being built together for the habitation of God. In the church, um, it's not just um, the body of Christ or the household of God. Um, Paul tells us that even as we practice church, we're being built up. And we're not being built up for any purpose. We're being built up specifically for God to be in our midst. And if God's Spirit's in our midst, then God's Spirit will give the Spirit the gifts of the Spirit. And this is where, as we connect with God's people, as we enter into the shared mission that we have with the church, where we begin to participate and live into our spiritual gifts. Now, it's, it's sort of like this. Um, I know most of you actually either walk... A lot of you are involved in, in some sort of exercise. And part of what you've been waiting on is the weather to break so you can get back outside because I know a lot of you walk. Uh, who are our walkers for exercise? A lot of walkers. Who runs? We're our runners. I've seen a couple pictures. We've got a few runners. If you're walking or you're running this season, there is a muscle that they tell us uh, that, well, actually... Uh, Fitness folks have been looking at the body for several years and what we're beginning to notice is we're, we're, we're not uh, focused on all the muscles we need to be focused on. For example, if you run or walk, you would think the most important muscles you need moving are the leg muscles and maybe your core, maybe your back a little. But actually one of the most important muscles you need working if you're going to walk or run this season is your feet. The muscles in your foot are some of the most important muscles you've got. They estimate that somewhere between two and five times your body weight crashes down on your feet every time you walk or every time you run. So imagine what your feet and your foot is going through. Now to take that a step further, I did a little research on the foot. There are, I think we knew this, most of us knew this, 26 bones in the foot. There are 33 joints and over 100 muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Now that's a fantastic muscle group, especially when you think or when you remember that the body has a little over 650 muscles or so. 100 of them are in your foot. 
That's a large muscle group. So here's the thing. The point is this. If you're going to run or walk, there's other parts, other muscle groups you need to be mindful of, not just the ones that you think you need. Here's another couple. Shoulders and neck. Uh, sometimes folks run like this, sometimes you walk like this, and your neck gets strained. You got to exercise your shoulders and your neck too. But, the point is again, runners and walkers need to exercise more muscle groups than, you, than we've normally thought we needed to exercise. Well, the same is true of the body of Christ. Paul says that the body, you can think of the body of Christ or the church like a human body. We have different muscle groups. And they all have to be moving and working properly if we're going to be healthy. And that's really what we're finding out in fitness. That it's not just the muscles you would think you use in a particular sport or exercise. You really need to be focused on the entire body. Because every muscle group participates in whatever it is you're doing and helps you maintain a healthy lifestyle. The same is true of the church. We have different muscle groups. And sometimes we think, well, these are not the most important ones. When really, they might actually be the most important ones. Inviting somebody to church, Sunday school, being a part of our midweek activities, being a part of worship, being a part of music. Uh, there are a lot that our gifts, that our different muscle groups can be involved in and should be involved in. So this week, as we move forward, and next week will be our last uh, week in this series, so we will finish the Apostles' Creed next week. But as you move through your week this week, I want to encourage you to be mindful of how important that statement is. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints is. Because it's very important. Without that statement, without that belief, we cannot truly be connected with God's people. We can't really share in God's mission for the church. And I'm not sure how we're going to work out our gifts and our different muscle groups if we're not connected in realizing what else needs to be working and what else needs to be moving. So this week, be encouraged. Be encouraged that you're a part of the body of Christ and be encouraged that your muscle group is important. Even to what we're doing this morning, it is very important. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity uh, to gather as the body of Christ, the household of God, the believers. Lord, we ask that as we move through Lent and closer towards Easter, that we be reminded that we are the church, that we're a part of the church, connected with men and women who have come before us, and connected with those who will come after us. Ministries have come and gone, and ministries have yet to even begin through your church. So Lord, we pray for the body of Christ this morning, where that body finds itself, and whatever community it finds itself. Encourage and be with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.